Hello and a warm welcome to our little talk about chat control or chat monitoring. This, uh, this talk came into existence relatively spontaneously because it's a topic that we'll, they will have to live with in the following months a lot. So we have Konstantin, Kalisi and me, Tom, from the Digital Society. And we want to say thank you very much to the Studio Suthaus in Berlin, who spontaneously built the studio for us. And thank you very much for the content team, who just fit us in on short order. And it costs a lot of nerves, I'm sure. So thank you very, very much. So very spontaneously we created this because I think it's a topic some of you might have heard about, but it is very high up on the political agenda, or it should be, for people who care about our rights as citizens. And we will get into detail a little later what exactly it means. But it's about pretty heavy surveillance measures that should be or will be introduced and that will also affect end-to-end -end encryption. So we think that this topic, and there are concrete plans already on the EU level, that we have to, to mention this and to face this. And we'll get back to the action that we are planning in the end and how you can participate. And right after the talk, there is a workshop planned, what we can do, how we can do that in the following month. Because we think that right now we have a chance to chance those really dystopian plans and maybe stop them before they come into action. So, chat control or chat monitoring. Some of you or most of you probably heard about this before. It was a topic in the last years, but I want to explain quickly what exactly it is because there is some confusion. So, especially last year, it was uh, used to under, or understood as an exemption from e-privacy. And e-privacy is something most of you will know about. So it's, it's about the e-privacy rule that still Happens. So we are talking about data protection when communicating, when communicating digitally. And the main problem with this ruling, this rule, that surveillance is not allowed. So it's guaranteed or it's supposed to be guaranteed that you have trustworthy communication, that not state agencies or um, companies can have surveillance on our communication and control it. <laughs> so what has happened so far with chat control or chat monitoring? We have this. So I'm not sure if it is readable on the slide. So the e-privacy um, guideline, it instructs national states to take care that surveillance and interception of messages is made impossible or being banished. So now lawyers say, well, you have to be certain that this doesn't happen. We all know there are exceptions, but basically it should be made certain that whenever we communicate via phone or wherever, so this is not only about chats, but let's not get into detail. So our communication is not supposed to be monitored at all times. 
by companies, by state agents, whoever. Concrete. Uh, so, to be a bit more in detail, this guideline is in effect since 2018, but it uses a definition or used an older definition. And that is, has been replaced in 2018. So suddenly there were new definitions. What is electronic communication? What are the electronic communication services? And it defined that this is also a number in the not only de uh, number dependent services, but also those independent of numbers, phone numbers are affected by this. Before there was um, arguing and then suddenly some companies noticed and also the commission that Microsoft, Google and others even before that they were scanning communication mails, chats and, and so on and they were scanning it for um, documented child abuse sexual child abuse and there were different methods for this and so they noticed that the scanning already happened apparently only then and then they got hectic and in 2020 in September there was a new proposal and they said, well, we need an exception from the e-privacy guideline. And it happened as a decree, so it came into effect immediately. And they said that scanning for these things and also mentioning it or calling the police, basically, was still allowed. And only in July 2021, or already in July 2021, this came into effect. Some people worked against it, but all in all, it went through pretty unchanged. So we will call the, this Chat Control 1.0. That's the scanning that was voluntary. Genau. Yeah. Back then, also back in April 2021, the Commission announced that, yeah, it's important we have to introduce those exceptions. But they already said, in a few weeks, we'll also have uh, a draft that not only allows voluntary scanning, but that also makes it mandatory. And especially, and that was quite obvious back then, that it should also include end-to-end -end encrypted communication. A few weeks turned into a full year by now. And we don't really know what's planned there. Commissioner Johansson fixed, is very fixed on this, that it should be mandatory for service providers to scan for such material. And this is all public knowledge. What the plans are in detail, we don't know. But we have to see that we are handling a commission that is now headed by Ursula von der Leyen, a German politician who is, has a bad history of surveillance. And that's the commission that plans a few things. We don't know any details yet. There was a leak recently so there was 
There was an account or a report about possible plans and apparently this gui these guidelines will be quite far-reaching. So grooming should be punishable as well and be scanned for. And uh, the issue is how to scan for new material that would only be possible through AI or something. That's something we will not talk about that much. So it's a bit dystopian what we have to expect. And in particular regarding the very clear com commitment that the Commission seems to have. And at the same time, a new parallel, another parallel development is that Encryption, uh, of course, this is not something that's been in the focus for the last year or so. European governments, worldwide governments, um, have this in 2020. The Council of Ministers under the German presidency at the time. So the heading, the German interior ministry headed the respective uh, committee. There are there was a paper from which I want to quote a few things. So back then in 2020, the idea was that in a dialogue with the IT industry, they wanted to come up with new technologies to to circumvent encryption in communication. And they cited terrorism, organized crime, sexual abuse, but another large number of cyber crimes and uh, crimes enabled in the cyberspace. So you have to keep this in mind when you say, when we talk about the concrete plans that we're talking about right now. So when they are talking about sexual abuse of children, this is what they have in mind as well as applications of the new technology. Now back then, the whole thing was mostly talked about as end-to-end -end encryption, which should be banned or circumvented. And in the last few years, the whole debate turned to client-side scanning, which uh, you may have heard about. There are plans from Apple um, that would not refer to communication through a messenger, but to matching hash values coming from a database, which I will be talking about. So matching these hash values with uh, files on the devices of the user. In August 2021, these plans were put forward by Apple, and there was quite an outcry from civil society organizations, politics, and scientists who all said, scientists in particular, in particular that this was a bad idea, and within one month, Apple backpedaled and said, we are going to postpone these plans. So that's the history before this. And I'm going, I have already alluded to the meaning of chat control. And I will now ask Konstantin to talk about chat control. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Yes, I'm going to sketch out what we actually talk about when we say chat control and there will also be a more technical view on this later on but i'm trying to break it down to make you see why in my view this is a form of surveillance infrastructure that we haven't seen yet so it would make sense to first delineate this from so-called traditional or classical surveillance these plans that apple put forward are helpful to understand what is envisaged when what we are talking about. So normally, when you use a messenger to communicate, the way it works is that from your smartphone, be it via a server or directly, you send a message to another smartphone. And traditional surveillance would start by eavesdropping on the communication and uh, intercepting the communication and decrypting it. And what has been started through Signal and other messengers is that end-to-end -end encryption has become such a standard uh, that about every messenger does or should offer this feature now, if they should be regarded as respectable messengers. And what 
and this is regarded as a problem by those supporting chat control. So business protection of our private communications, of course, protects everyone, including criminals who would like to transmit depictions of child sexual abuse through this channel. And the solution, therefore, is supposed to be that the confidentiality of all communications is attacked. There are three escalation scenarios in this, potential escalation scenarios, which I'll talk about, to, and these are all undermining end-to-end -end encryption in smartphones to find out which messages are sent and whether child sex abuse images are included in those messages. The first escalation stage is to look for known depictions of sexual abuse. So you will have known images and hash tag, hash, print, hash values for those, which you would match with the messages that are sent. Uh, so the messages would be compared to the values in databases. Then there is the search for hitherto unknown images. So you would need some kind of artificial intelligence for that, which tries to recognize what is the age of the people in the image? What is happening? Are these cases of child sexual abuse? And the third and most grave escalation stage is to try to detect grooming attempts from adults towards children. And that would require a content analysis of communications and probably a linking to, from this to other data that is available about the person. And we do know from the leaks and Ida Johann's utterances that this scenario is actively in debate and they are trying to establish this. So what have we done about this so far? Uh, from the time that the Apple plans were known at latest, uh, we know that we have that we're dealing with an attempt to establish a large surveillance infrastructure and that we have as a civil society have to stand against that so we try to build an alliance which has stable foundations we have edry european digital rights which published a, a paper of principles stating certain red lines that any draft uh, regulation would have to keep to because of course we do support the attempts to protect children but you cannot do this by bringing forward a regulation that is in violation of human basic rights and that will be nullified by the courts and which at the same time restricts the fundamental rights of everyone so this paper makes clear that there cannot be a blanket surveillance without cause. It has to be targeted, it has to be controlled, it needs a judicial uh, permission. And independent institutions have to control this. Client-side scanning is an unpermissible technology which would affect the communications of everyone and control and surveil everyone. We also say that it's not a solution to use clear, uh, solely technological measures to solve a social problem, social work, prevention, child protection, which really tackles the problem at its roots, that has to be put forward, and that has to be that it, it, and rather than trying to tackle it at the end. Now, with these principles that we agreed. We have applied pressure to decision makers. We wrote a letter to the European Commission. We had conversations with various actors in civil society to bring forward this position. We made input to the German coalition negotiations uh, with when the new government formed in last autumn. And we, you may have noticed that the coalition treaty says that automated scanning is rejected by the German government coalition, the Social Democrats, the Greens and the Liberals. And we will make sure that they are keeping to their promises. We try to raise awareness. We were able to uh, make a few journalists aware. And of course, we do advocacy work as well by contacting people from the European Parliament, for example. So what is going to happen now, presumably? At the moment, 
the draft is still being agreed on within the Commission. It had been postponed, it still is being postponed, which might be due to the fact that even within the Commission, there may be doubts about the legality of this draft. And surely it is also due to the massive resistance that has come from civil society. So we have had an effect already. We and all the others that have been raising their voices and it is necessary to keep being loud. The uh, envisioned state of publication is the 11th of May with a question mark because this has been postponed uh, and uh, we feel, we notice that Commissioner Johansson is having a hard time finding support for these plans. Where are we now? We are actually before the proposal of a regulation, uh, which is depicted in this graph, in this flowchart. So it's a good thing that we started building an alliance early and that we aren't surprised and uh, are articulating our concerns even now and that we built a foundation to maybe hopefully before it is being published to uh, resist this draft regulation. So this is where I'm going to hand over to Kalisi, who is going to talk about the technical side of things. Thank you. So how does it look from a technical standpoint? It already sounds bad. And I think once we look at the technology, it gets worse. So as Konstantin mentioned, we want to see how does it usually work when you communicate using a messenger. Usually it looks like this. This green line, that's end-to-end -end encryption. That's the end-to-end -end encryption of our communication. So Assad and Bettina, they communicate and the whole communication is end-to-end -end encrypted. So that means no one can read it not even the server that facilitates the communication. So now we enter the question, how can we still scan this? Right now, as Tom mentioned, the big tech companies are allowed to scan. So unencrypted communication, for example, uploading something to the Google Cloud, pictures or something, it can be scanned. And the idea to also include this or do this for end-to-end -end encrypted communication works similarly. The first escalation step is looking for already known material. For example, Microsoft, they have a big database of known pictures of abuse and these images are turned into hash values. So what are hashes or hash values? Hashes are like a fingerprint of an image. So a so-called hashing algorithm is used on the image and that is supposed to be uh, unique so that this fingerprint only matches this image. And then there is two scenarios. One, or the first one, is that you scan on the device. So there where the magnifying glass is, that's where the search would happen. So that would mean that whenever you are sending an image, a hash is created, and then your phone contacts or uses a hash database and compares this image to all the known images that's part of the sexual abuse material. And then this image would then be sent to the service provider. And this might for some of you sound not that bad, but you should know that it's attackable. So there is additional software on your phone. And if someone can compromise your phone or maybe you root your phone, 
kann man diese Software entweder relativ leicht Then you can either trick the software or you can just change it. So you might include hashes or might change the hash database so pictures of maybe protests are added and then you get flagged. There are other open questions, but we'll come to that later. The second scenario, or the second version of this, is to have everything on the server. So we all know that even if our phones are basically computers were 10 years ago, we still have limited space. So of course we can't download all the hashes, or that would make our phones slower at least. And that's unwanted, of course. So the second option is to compare the hashes on the server. So your message is still end-to-end -end encrypted, but the image is turned into a hash. That hash is sent to the server, and the server then compares the hashes. So that's the second version. So it always goes over the server. And then if it was flagged, of course it has, be, has to be checked by a human and we should remember that. The second scenario that Konstantin already proposed was scanning for previously unknown material. So until now we were looking for material we already know exists, but now we want to look for new material that is previously unknown. How can we do that? Well, AI fans will shout now, yeah, use AI, image recognition. And what they basically do or can do is just guess, is there a person on the image? How old is the person? How much skin is there on this image? And just how does it make humans react, basically. And that's what could be used, but of course the problem is if we have young people who just text and maybe send each other nudes, then this classifier could already flag it. Or maybe you are uh, on holiday with your kid and maybe there is an image from the beach and maybe the kid is naked and because the kid is very young and a lot of skin shown it flags your picture. So again there are two ways to do this. First on the phone so we already have no, we need to have already trained classifiers and this classifier is used to sort images into categories so it could say, yeah, this is a young kid and likely abuse. So what do we have to do? We have to train classifiers. And to do that we need data. And we need people who say, yes, this is correct and this is not correct. This classification. And all this is then put on our phone and the classifier already runs, uh, always runs on over all the images before we send them. And should the classifier flag something, then the material is sent to the provider, then controlled or checked again. And should it really be um, prohibited material, then of course there will be a, an according reaction. The other option, of course, is to have this classifier run on the server we already talked about this, the phones are powerful already, but still limited. So it would be better to outsource this, so we have it run on the server. So now we have to check all the pictures on a server. So all the images are now taken out of end-to-end -end encryption. And of course this is a problem, because if I can enter or break into the server, I have access to everything. Now the question is how long is it kept on the server of course and the classifier can be manipulated if you have access to the server but the same of course is valid for the phone. 
I can always attack the system. And I don't know about you, but I think I don't like the idea of uploading the images of my small niece to some server. That's why I use end-to-end -end encryption, because I don't want that. And now there's scenario 3, which is the most likely scenario so far, or seems like it. So not only scanning pictures, but also scanning text. So now we need text recognition software, and this software needs uh, uh, tries to detect grooming. It tries to detect age, which is difficult, of course, in the grooming context. So if you know that a person, an old per older person who attempts grooming, they change their language. So how do we differentiate between sexting of teenagers and grooming or attempted grooming? So it's difficult and it would imply that this end-to-end -end encryption has to be broken. Because if we do it on the device, then we have the classifier problem. The classifier is trained, but AI can be wrong. And it's very difficult to put it into context. And if we have it on a server, then we all know, yeah, if we scan the text on the server, there is no end-to-end -end encryption anymore. So we have a whole bandwidth, uh, a whole array of problems that we cannot easily solve. So much for the technology behind it, but of course there's not only technology. Some people might think, yeah, we can we can de develop something for that, but of course there is more. So what's the basic problem with this control and scanning? I mentioned it before. Of course, with technology, we already always have the problem of missing context. So if I send some image of my kid to my partner, or if it's abuse, it's very difficult to differentiate and we all would be put under surveillance and especially with teenagers, when they do sexting or send nudes, it would al always mean that this material is taken out of context and is reviewed by, uh, for, uh, by strangers and that's a problem. Then we have the image review done by providers, because usually it's not directly sent to policing um, agencies, because they have a lot of, a lot on their plate already. So there is review done by the platforms. And we already I always know that it usually is done by service providers, by third parties who are badly paid. And it's a very intransparent um, action, and we don't really know the criteria. But yeah, so the next is the legal aspect. So, looking back to the title of this talk, the secrecy of letters is in the title, and there's the secrecy of communications, which is a fundamental right enshrined in the German constitution, for example. So. The, this is the affected law, and there is an opinion by a former judge from the ECJ, if I happen to mishear that, who said that the ECJ simply would not accept this proposal. But of course, it has been our experience with data retention that as soon as the device is there, it takes a long time to get it removed again legally. The next issue is mass surveillance without cause. Now, psychologically, uh, the fact is that we will not be able to trust our devices anymore. And these days, our mobile device is the most personal thing that we possess. For most people, it is a kind of diary. I think there are several people who simply put all their notices, whatever they think, their images, whatever, into their mobile phone. So the feeling that you lose control over your device because there might be a software on it that controls it is grave. And some might remember this wonderful 
slogan by the Reclaim Your Face campaign, there is the so-called chilling effect, as if, if I, as a person, feel under surveillance, I regulate myself, basically. So this is not just a threat to the personal space uh, and the feeling that someone constantly is intruding there, but it's an issue for activism, for people that get engaged politically or that want to take part in activism. Now, economically, we know this debate. We have known it from other areas. Of course, the uh, motto always is Microsoft, Google, the giants have their software in place. They have an application for this and smaller platforms will have a problem. There are ideas to uh, have an open source solution available. You could say, okay, there is an open source solution, but then again, you have to look how much would I trust this software really? I may not have a black box anymore, but I still, there, there, there still might be changes. This is not so, this is not something I want, and people with less technological knowledge will simply not be able to uh, understand what's going on. And the political level, we have said that the Council of Ministers back in 2020 already said that these innovative surveillance technologies is some, are th something they want to use. And concre in concrete, this means the probability that they are going to use it is quite high and use it for other purposes too. In a time when climate activism is criminalized, when Viktor Orban is censoring a lot of things in society, you really have to ask, do you want to give this tool to anyone? And I think the answer has to be no, because it's always going to be exploited and abused as once it's there. And if we in Europe do it, it will be out in the world. And once it's out there, others will want to use it. And that means that very quickly images of political calls uh, might be affected. Now, pragmatically, practically, um, we did already talk about the fact that implementing this without breaking encryption is not possible. And it has to be made clear too that what a chat actually is, that is a big question. How about decentralized services? How about pin boards where you put up notices to exchange messages? It's not really defined. How about end-to-end -end encrypted emails? So this might be a difficult issue and very fundamentally, the security authorities are under a lot of strain already. The Swiss Federal Police said already that a large amount of these things are simply too much for them to look at. There are too many false positives. So the whole tool didn't wasn't of much use. And to just react to events again gives you too much data and more data isn't necessarily better. And the other question is, these databases that contain these hash values, which are used to compare content to, where would they be stored? We have seen the current Europol debate that they have a large amount of data, but cannot really say what's actually in there. And the question, therefore, is how well is this suited to be used in this context? So fundamentally, is this a good idea? Clearly, no, it's not. And one other thing you have to keep in mind is that as soon as something like this is used, the perpetrators will be driven underground. And that doesn't mean that it will be any easier to find them. Now, what we call for, as Konstantin already said, we do not want end-to-end -end encryption to be undermined. We don't want any obligation for scanning in messenger apps we want investment into victim protection programs and good police work rather than a blanket surveillance. And we want a good legal basis for deleting this data, uh, 
because it has been in the press that the German Federal Criminal Police Office does find data but has no legal found, uh, basis to delete those data so that no data ever gets deleted. What can we do? We've seen that we are at the very start of the debate in contrast to other issues where we only got involved as the debate was actually uh, in the middle of its uh, process. So we have a chance to really raise an alarm right now. For one thing, we can uh, pr apply pressure to the German Interior Minister, Nancy Faeser, who is, of course, in the Council of Ministers of the Interior Ministers, remind her of her coalition treaty. And you could always call your MPs, your members of parliament, and talk to them about it and make them understand what is at stake. You'll find us on Twitter and Mastodon under Chatgeheimnis, chat that's German for chat secret. The hashtag is chatcontrolle, German for chat control. And of course, we're happy for any donations for our campaign materials. And the Twitter and Mastodon accounts will give you the links to donate. What you also can do is use um, there was someone who asked people through Abgeordnetenwatch.de, a platform to ask German members of parliaments for their positions, and we've had some clear answers from Konstantin von Notz, for example, the Green politician. politician. So these platforms are a cool way of contacting members of the German parliament, at least, and ask them to take a position, to, to make their position known and to remind them of the coalition treaty and, and make them aware of what makes sense in that regard. Now, how will it continue after our Q&A? We will have a workshop as well to show you how you can take joint action, maybe in a different kind of context, discuss how we can do, what we can do to make the breadth of civil society aware of things. And I think the DEVOC motto of Bridging Bubbles is very well suited for that, because who, if not us, is placed to bring this message forward and really tell people that there is a real problem coming and we we'll have to do something because our communication is under threat and we need encryption as a fundamental right and as a foundation for our democracy. I think it's a very important issue and for several people it will be perhaps kind of hard to grasp, but I think there are good ways to make people aware of the issue and I think that's what we need to do. And that I think leads me to the questions that you may have right now. Any questions or comments or requests? None? Oh, that's a pity. Do you have any questions? There's nothing in the pad, apparently. This interpreter hasn't opened the pad yet. In that case, I will close the session here. Please follow us on Twitter or Mastodon. And if there are questions, you can reach out to us, Konstantin and myself, through our personal accounts. You can use, uh, you can reach as well. And Tom can be reached via the Digital Society, Digitale Gesellschaft. I very much recommend following EDRI, European Digital Rights, to keep to be updated on the uh, going on at the European level. And I look forward to seeing you in the workshop. The Big Blue Button Room is linked to on the page uh, on the self-organized sessions page. I haven't got the link in my head at the moment, but I think. The DVOC website will lead you there, and that will hopefully make you find us self-organized session, as I said. And I hope to see you in the workshop, and I'm look, I look forward to